Hello, I'm Penny Thornton and I'm talking astrology. On this video, I'm going to be talking about the total lunar eclipse of the 16th of May and a few of the other things going on at the same time. But first, uh, a few details about the, uh, the eclipse itself. Um, this is the second eclipse of 2022, and it is part of, uh, you know, we had the solar eclipse a couple of weeks ago, 30th of April, so now this is the second. But it's also a little bit more than that, because back in November, November the 19th, we had another lunar eclipse, which was the mirror image of this one. So we've got a little kind of story going on, a little narrative between last November and this May. And I'll expand on that a little bit more as we go along. Now, the eclipse is, um, is a supermoon eclipse. So it's going to loom quite large, if you can see it. And um, it's also going to be a reddish color, and that's not got anything to do with this dust from the Sahara Desert, so to speak, but it has to do with the refraction of light and the different, on the spectrum of light. Um, it's also a long eclipse. It's going to take uh, a, roughly about an hour and a half to complete itself. And, you know, with these kind of added details, especially as uh, we know that the, high, the tides are going to be higher than usual. You know, there is that feeling, is it because all these other things, the fact it's a super moon, the fact that it's such a long eclipse, is that going to make a difference to what we assume to be the effects of this in terms of events on Earth? Well, I'm not sure I can answer that question for you because I've known partial eclipses that, that have come at the same time as a really big, earthquake or things like that. So I think we just have to say that eclipses in general are game changers. They tend to be the signature on major events that happen in the world and of course in our own lives as well. And if we can leave it at that, that's uh, in, enough for us to be going on with. Of course, the other thing is where you, can you see this eclipse? Because often when we can see what's going on in the heavens, when we saw the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, uh, for instance, I was over the moon, <laughs> excited when I saw the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, lots of photographs of it. Um, and somehow it sort of plugs you into the fact that this is life happening out there in the, in the solar system, so to speak, and it, it makes you see it as, as, as a reality. Um, so you will be able to see this total eclipse if you live in South America, anywhere in South America, uh, Africa, you can also see it in the eastern part of North America, we'll be able to see it in Europe and the United Kingdom, but as you go progressively uh, east, you'll see it less and less until you get to Australia, and uh, you won't see it at all, and nor will you see it in Hawaii or Los Angeles. So um, well, you'll see something, but it won't be, you know, you won't see that shadow across uh, the moon, so to speak, the moon with a bite out of it. Um, so um, one of the things that I've been uh, very uh, vocal about is the fact that I've seen the period from the full moon of the 16th of April through to this uh, total lunar eclipse as a four week period of major developments. Again, this can be in our own lives. And of course, you may have had special events like christenings and births and marriages and all those kind of things that already make this a significant period. But of course, it's significant for other reasons, all those developments out in the world, uh, especially with Ukraine and Russia. Uh, we've seen just how, what a part full moons, new moons really play in the story and the narrative of this war. So I've seen, you know, this four week period as pretty crucial. And one of the things that I feel about this total lunar eclipse is that it brings the curtain down on a certain uh, set of events. And I'll go into that again a little bit more once we start to uh, look at uh, you know, the eclipse in a little bit more detail in the, in the horoscope. Um, the other thing about this eclipse is that it is uh, connects with Algol. 
which is a fixed star in the uh, constellation Perseus. I talked about this last November because last November's eclipse did as well. Um, the actual uh, star itself is 26 degrees of Taurus. But um, of course, you know, if you've got anything on that uh, grand cross, so to speak, so we're looking at uh, a 26 of Scorpio, 25, 24, 27, around those degrees. And the same with Leo and Aquarius, you really pick up uh, this, not only the eclipse, but also Algol. Now, all the fixed stars, uh, with the exception of a handful, uh, really have... <laughs> pretty dire interpretations add, add, you know, uh, um, to them. They, they were thought in large part to be um, omens of disaster somehow. If you had something near them or there was an eclipse, you know, conjunct Algol, for instance. If we went back 2000 years to when the Babylonians and the early astrologers uh, were really refining all their mathematical and astronomical uh, information, the interpretation of eclipse was indeed very dire. It was the birth of the king, the death of the king, the start of the war, the end of the war, always those kind of things. By the time we get to the 16th century, for instance, we're still seeing eclipses and the fixed stars playing a very, very important role in interpretation and forecasting, again, with quite a kind of negative view. Um, and in fact, one of the features of Algol, um, and it's also called the devil star, and it uh, is also called a Medusa star in some cases, although the Medusa is part of that constellation Perseus. And if we remember our myth, Medusa was once the most beautiful uh, uh, goddess, and she was turned, uh, made, in, well, uh, hair became a, a kind of nest of uh, snakes by Minerva, who was jealous of her. So um, we get this idea what happened with um, uh, Medusa is that if you saw her, caught her eye, you'd be turned to stone. And also the, uh, when Medusa was killed, one of the arrows that Hercules had dipped in the Medusa's blood was the arrow that struck Chiron and gave him the wound that he could never heal. So the mythology of all of this is always very interesting because it does give us insights into the process that we're look, look, looking at. Largely, of course, a psychological process more than anything, but it's always very interesting. So Algol, aside from being or considered to be very violent, that the, a kind of symbol of violence and violent events, did have its good side, and partly because some astrologers saw uh, the equality of Algol being Jupiter. And of course, we all associate Jupiter with great good fortune and growth and expansion, all the things we like. And this may be where we also understand that Algol has a lot to do if it is in your chart, close to one of your planets or points, that it has very high spiritual rays, but only if you're open enough to receive them, won't do anything if you're not. And I think my advice would be, as you all rush to your horoscopes and see what you've got anywhere near 26 degrees of Scorpio, Taurus, Aquarius and Leo before you uh, get, uh, you know, <laughs> paranoid about it. Um, I think, you know, one of the things to, to look at there is the reminder to treat life and the things you're involved with, the pursuits you have in with high motivation. And when you think about Pablo Picasso, who had Jupiter conjunct Algol, one of the great artists of all times, when we think about uh, Princess Diana, Algol conjunct Venus, and we think of Johnny Depp with Venus conjunct Algol. And finally, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, who has Algol conjunct her IC. Now, are these people really bad people? Absolutely not. Did they have incredible bad luck happening to them? Well, they've had their fair share of bad things happen to them, just like all of us. But what we're seeing here are really significant individuals who've used themselves as vehicles 
for extraordinary things, extraordinary talent, extraordinary behavior. And that's what you need to look at if you're locating Algol somewhere in your particular chart. So uh, what I want to look at now is the chart of the uh, lunar eclipse so that we can see in more detail why it's extra significant this time. So as you will see when you look at the chart, um, I've drawn it uh, a big triangle there. We see the sun opposition the moon from the nine o'clock position to the three o'clock position. And what the triangle is doing is pointing to Saturn because Saturn is at the apex of that opposition. Now I've set this uh, horoscope from the point of view of Johannesburg in South Africa, because at the time I'm recording this video for you, there are the most dreadful rains in South Africa and they've caused in incredible, unimaginable damage and loss of life. So I thought I'd bring them into the picture and see actually, you know, how this eclipse, you know, is what the nature of this eclipse is in terms of the astrology that we're looking at here. Now, if we take them apart piece by piece, if we look at the sun squaring Saturn, just as it is, let's not even think about an eclipse at all. Just think of sun square Saturn. And in fact, the sun does square Saturn on the 15th of May. So when we see this, we know there is struggle. Uh, we know there is conflict, internal conflict within ourselves and conflict out there within the world. But the idea is always with Saturn that we master those difficulties and we make something concrete out of them. So there is both struggle and growth in a way with a sun Saturn square. With a moon Saturn square, if we see this in a natal chart or, you know, because the moon won't stay very long, maybe a day is going to be squaring Saturn, but it can often depress us. We feel emotionally kind of negative. We, we're not looking at that glass half full. We're looking at it very half empty. So now we think of a full moon squaring Saturn. We think of the full moon, and in this case, a total lunar eclipse, um, synchronizing with the idea of endings, of closure and completion. And we can see there's something very final about any conclusions we are drawing or any endings that are happening. It's pretty final. Now, um, you know, you can treat that any way you want because sometimes we really do want to make an ending done and dusted. That's it. We're not going back there. It's over. And that's a good thing. But sometimes, let's say in the nature of a relationship, we might be really, really sad that a relationship is ended, but it will have ended under this. You know, Saturn is that kind of uh, astrological figure on the landscape that says, look, it is time. Era ora. We have reached that time. The hands on the cosmic clock have reached this point. So you can imagine, as I'm talking about this configuration, just what this will do to the events on the world stage at this point. And of course, as I said, I'm you know, a couple of weeks ahead of this, I'm recording this video for you. So we don't know exactly how the war in Ukraine has unfolded, but I can say straight off the bat that this configuration, especially as it plays into the charts of Russia and Ukraine, um, Putin and Zelensky, that this is going to be some important turn of the tide in the war, and we, we can leave it at that. The other things I want to look at in this chart, aside from the big configuration itself, and um, what is interesting here before I move on, is we can see Pluto at 20 degrees of Capricorn. So Pluto is tied up with this uh, uh, lunar eclipse as well. It's trining the sun and it's sextiling the moon. And we might think that there's quite a positive uh, energy, for want of a better word, about that kind of configuration. But I have to say, Pluto, as I've mentioned before, is involved in all the full moons up to really this one and maybe the next one as well. Um, 
And it really has brought a lot of strife and things that have been buried deep into the earth. They're coming up to the surface to be looking at very confrontational. And so we need to bear that in mind as well. Also, I want us to look at the planet Mars. If we go towards the 11 o'clock position in this chart, we can see Mars at 23 degrees Pisces and Neptune at 24 degrees of Pisces. Uh, so we've got here um, that uh, conjunction. It's going to happen exactly on the 18th, but I want us to think about this whole cluster of astrological events together. The total lunar eclipse squaring Saturn and the applying Mars-Neptune conjunction. And what do we get with Mars and Neptune? We get chaos and confusion. We sometimes get miracles as well. And we get kind of divine, that sense of divine providence that can come out of this. Compassion, healing, great sensitivity, great art, where all these things are Neptune derived. And Mars and Neptune together, Mars energizing that Neptunian principle. But we have to be real as well. This is coming in the context of a very difficult period astrologically. And I suspect things will be pretty chaotic in certain parts of the world. Same for us. If we feel confused by events, we just need to remember that we will move forward from here. And however confusing things may be, whatever difficulties we're facing or conundrums we're facing, we will come through the other side of them. And we have to remember that that's human nature and it's the human condition, it's evolution for want of a better word. So um, I'm going to come away from that chart for a minute. And I want us to try to remember where that configuration was. Remember, we were looking at the total lunar eclipse and we're looking at uh, 25 degrees of, um, let me just make sure I'm right, 25 degrees of Taurus Scorpio. And we're looking at Saturn at almost 25 degrees of Aquarius. And this becomes very significant when we look at the chart of Queen Elizabeth the second. And I'm going to bring that up on the screen right now so you can see it because what I've done here is <laughs> give you that triangle again. Only now we can see that that uh, total lunar eclipse is on her MCIC axis, her life direction axis, and Saturn is squaring it. And Saturn is conjunct her Mars Jupiter conjunction and opposing Neptune. And by association, the moon is kind of linked up to that. So this is a very significant event in royal circles. Now, to get things in perspective, uh, back in November last year, November the 19th, there was a mirror image of this eclipse. So we've already seen this before. It's already happened on the axis of the MCIC axis of the Queen. We're just seeing it reversed now. So we could say we've been there, got the T-shirt, you know, done that. But on this occasion, the difference is we've got Saturn squaring it. So that makes it a little bit more profound. If we go back to November of last year and we think about the Queen, it's sort of from that period, she started to retreat from us a bit. She started to have problems with her mobility and you know, we didn't see her out in force. And really since then, that situation has uh, got, you know, worse in a way. She's still her vital self. We see her on virtually on our television. So we know that she's a, still a very vital woman, but obviously physically she has been uh, withdrawing and there has been a deterioration in her physical health. So I think this lunar eclipse definitely plays into that. And um, we, of course, also had a lunar eclipse on the 30th of April, which was none too far from her birthday. So my feeling is that around this time, and when we think about what happens when we get eclipses like this, caught up with Saturn in our own chart, 
Um, <laughs> and we think what the Queen has been through since November of last year, she's been coping with scandals uh, and to a large part the affair uh, to do with Prince Andrew, um, uh, you know, it's ended in a way, there's no trial to come, uh, but it's sort of still in the air, isn't it? it hasn't gone away, and that would have been enough on its own, but there's also the estrangement within the royal family, the problems with one's offspring, if she was queen, if it was my offspring, that makes you feel very unhappy when your family isn't happy. And she called 1992 when the divorces of both uh, Andrew and Sarah and uh, the Prince and Princess of Wales came about, uh, well, at least the separation of the Prince and Princess of Wales. She referred to this as her Annus Horribilis. And I would think this too, this period is another Annus Horribilis, but maybe it ends for her in terms of that idea of an Annus Horribilis with the curtain coming down on the uh, total lunar eclipse, because we're not very far away from the big celebrations for her 70th uh, year on the throne, the platinum jubilee. And so we can see it in a positive sense. But as I say, you know, eclipses, they're, they're difficult things. And uh, we can't always uh, guarantee that, uh, you know, we're going to have celebration and jubilation. There's usually some challenge and difficulty in there too. So let's come back to me and I'm going to start looking at this uh, total lunar eclipse sign by sign. But there is, uh, well, two more points I, I really wanted to make. Um, if you're an astrological buff, this total lunar eclipse is part of the Saros series 131. And if you remember, because I've talked about it before, the Saros series is a family of eclipses. These eclipses are grouped as families uh, according to their astronomical you know, where, how they are astronomically. Let's just leave it at that, nice and simple. Um, and the last eclipse there was in this uh, cycle from memory, I think the current one we're coming to is uh, 34 in the cycle. So we're looking at number 33, the one before it. That took, pla took place in May of 2004. So again, this is another thing for you to look back on and see around that time. If there was anything significant in your life in May of 2004, because there's an echo, a resonance with that period. And very interestingly, uh, some of the events that I looked at around that period, a little bit before the eclipse, um, Google, uh, Google Mail was born, Gmail was born. And also very close to the uh, eclipse day itself, Ukraine won the uh, Eurovision Song Contest, and I'd love to see that as an omen of things to come. And one other thing about the eclipse as well, you know I talk about the uh, cycles, the new moon to full moon, so this cycle had its beginnings on the 4th of November, 2021, and it will have its completion on the 16th of May this year. So if you think again around that time, did you begin anything? What significant events were there? Because as we come to the 16th of May, there is some kind of closure. There is some kind of stage reached from which if things go forward, they'll be different. So it's a point of assessment for some, if you can make that link, and for others, it's a cycle completely in itself. What began on the 4th of November 2021 is finished, or around that time. Let's be, you know, on the day, let's do a week or so before, a week or so after. It will be completed, done and dusted by the time we get to just before the 16th of May or sort of after it. Let's have that little room to manoeuvre there. One other thing to point out, and I didn't, uh, well, you probably did notice it if you were looking at the horoscope. Um, on the 10th of May, Jupiter went into Aries and it's going to spend right through until the end of October in the sign of Aries. It's not going to get very far. It's going to only get through the first decanate. So we're looking at the March born Arians, or if you've got planets between about one and 10 of Aries, or 
the cardinal signs, that means Cancer, Capricorn uh, and Libra, then you, you'll pick up the benefits of Jupiter because there are always benefits with Jupiter. Yes, Jupiter inflates, inflates and we can get all sorts of situations that spiral out of control, especially financially. Um, but there's also good news and progress, success and happiness. And I will be talking a lot more about Jupiter in Aries, um, probably later on in the year, when I'll give it a really full go. But one point I do want to make, and this is quite interesting, um, in my year ahead, in the, you know, you can still get my year ahead uh, on Astrolutely if you want to read the whole thing, but the uh, overview, which looks at the whole year generally, I had pointed out that with Jupiter and Aries, often what happens is the emergence of a great leader, courageous and strong. And I think that's very apt in uh, Vladimir, Vladimir uh, Zelensky's case because he emerged out of anywhere and going from memory, I think he might be a sun Aries as well. He certainly got some Aries in his chart. So we really did see the fulfillment of that Jupiterian promise in Zelensky. So enough said on uh, the Jupiter factor, and let's get into sign by sign what this lunar eclipse will mean. Now, the important thing to get into your uh, thinking about this uh, total lunar eclipse is that it's going to involve two signs and two houses. In other words, because the sun is opposed to the moon, you've got one sign and the opposite sign. So it isn't just, you know, for instance, when I talked about the solar eclipse, we were really, really focused on where that was singularly in your chart. But here we've got a binary situation. So if we start off and we think about, well, the total lunar eclipse, the moon itself is in the sign of Scorpio. So that means that for Scorpio, it's in your first house. Or if you happen to know you've got Scorpio rising, then this lunar eclipse is in the first house. The moon in the first house, the sun in the seventh house. It's what we call the relationship axis. So that means that a relationship is likely to be the focus for this total lunar eclipse. Does it mean you're ready to move forward with a relationship and make it bigger, longer, more important? Is it marriage? Is it forming a business, uh, signing a contract with a company? Those kind of things, done and dusted, signed and sealed. You can get that with this lunar eclipse. But so too, will you get the idea of the unending? You come to the end of a contract, a marriage contract maybe, or a contract with a company or your business is at an end. So it's all over, done. Um, the moon is in your first house, is in Scorpio. And so really and truly, the moon is with you. You have the power, you are empowered. So the actions you take, especially when we think about the will, the purpose, which is a mind thing, isn't it? If we attach the emotions to that, just how powerful are we? So uh, relationships are very important at this time. There may well be, as I used this uh, expression before, a turn in the tide with a relationship. So we come to the opposite uh, uh, sign and we think of Taurus. Well, uh, the moon is in your seventh house and the sun, of course, is in your first house because we're in the time of Taurus. So in a way, often when the sun is moving through your sign, you've sort of got the uh, solar rays, as it were, right beaming into your sun sign, or if you've got Taurus rising, then you've got the sun in the first house. So it's recharging your personal batteries, if you like. So it is giving more power to your elbow. And there's a lot of things about image and the personal ambitions and desires you have with the sun moving through this area. And it is a time, the sun being the solar force. And I always say, 
in astrology when you're looking at what the sun means it's your brand it's like your nationality it's like being british or australian or south african you know that's your brand you you share that with all the other south africans and whatever the same with being a leo or a taurus or whatever your brand is there so the idea the sun is in your own sign is a kind of rebranding <laughs> and you think of it like that in all the connotations of rebranding that's a really good thing uh, an image to uh, embrace but of course relationships come into it for you as well and likewise it might be time to end or begin a relationship or take it to a new stage but remember with eclipses as a, as a whole the people who are in our lives at that time who come into our lives they turn out to be significant in some way. I often say that it is a person or people who bring the meaning of the eclipse into our lives. So that might be a very interesting thing to think about, Taurus, in those terms. Come to Aquarius. The moon itself is in the 10th house, the sun in the 4th house. So we've got the what we call the axis of life direction in play. So I often think there's a balancing act, always at work with this fourth, tenth axis. How much of our lives is spent out in the world and building our place in the world, our job, uh, the things that take us out amongst the world, versus our private life, our private selves, our subjective world, our home, our family. Is there balance? There should be. And it may be that something like this total lunar eclipse is going to say the balance is out. And if you remember, you know, we're also going to be looking at this uh, total lunar eclipse with the idea of Saturn being involved there. Now, in fact, Saturn is you. You are Aquarius. So you have some say in what you bring to an end at this point or how you act about events that are, you know, taking shape in your world. Um, and it is a, a kind of moment of truth, I think, for you, Aquarius. You get to see what's real and what is still worth piling your energies and heart and soul into and what really isn't worth it anymore and there may be an aspect to do with family here as well and to do with your home well we have this in reverse when we come to leo because for leo um, the sun is in the 10th house at the moment so it's illuminating everything to do with your place in the world it's often a time when you really get behind your ambitions and the people and uh, uh, authority figures, they have quite a big say in where you go and how you go. Um, and it is a good time to set out your market stall and to seek growth and uh, development in, in terms of your career. But of course, where, you know, where, where is the moon? Well, the moon is in the fourth house. So the emotional power is in the fourth house, it's all to do with home. And in this case, where is Saturn intersecting that eclipse? It's coming from the seventh house. So other people have a huge part to play in the interpretation of all of this. Other people have a say in how this works out for you, whether it is about your career, whether it is about your family and home. And it is probably a time when you realize the power other people have in your life. And, you know, I know, Leo, you like to have control and you are a powerful sign. But sometimes you just have to take a back seat or you just have to acknowledge other people may have the upper hand right now. And being gracious and dignified in that is quite a lesson and it's a good thing. So if we come to Virgo now, um, what we're looking here when we think about Virgo rising in your case or uh, you know where is this uh, lunar eclipse the moon is in the third house and the sun is in the ninth house so we've got this axis of communication in play both of it so <laughs> both ends of the axis so 
this lunar eclipse can, in a funny kind of way, like it does on the first seventh axis and what we saw with Taurus and Scorpio, it can signal a contract, whether you sign a contract or you end a contract, because this axis of the horoscope has a lot to do with legal matters too. And so when you sign a contract, there are legal implications. The law is involved. So this uh, total lunar eclipse may have something to do with the law, may have something to do with making something legal, um, but it also has to do with travel. And uh, the sun being in the ninth house for you, uh, Virgo, uh, may be a time when you are planning lots of travel, going away and quite some distance. But of course, in order to do that, you have to deal with all sorts of uh, aspects of that trip and they're the, the finer details if you like. And with the moon in the third house, the focus of that lunar eclipse in the third house, we also have the feeling that there's something about your immediate environment in play. Now, let's take a, a simple example here of the environment. And I'm going to attach it to the uh, Jubilee celebrations, for instance, which are a couple of weeks away, less than that. Um, it may be that you've got lots of things going on in your neighborhood so that it's at this time of the lunar eclipse, either everything is arranged and done and you've been talking to everybody concerned in your neighborhood, or you've got a bit of a crisis. Maybe it's a crisis about the weather. Maybe it's a crisis about something so that that's what this total lunar eclipse is about. But, you know, be... Uh, kind of free to express what this means. Because on the one hand, we're uh, playing with that theme of conclusion, which means drawing to an understanding, getting to an understanding, closing and completing on something, or something having come to an end. And I think if you are traveling around the time of the eclipse, especially the day after or the day before, you may have some you know, difficulties because Mercury is retrograde on top of that. So there could be some travel delays and diversions, and especially looking at this axis, you'll want to leave plenty of time for your journeys and just to keep on checking whether you've got all your ducks in a row, as do all the transport systems as well. Now, if we come to Pisces, we have it in reverse, so we're still in communications, everything I've just said about travel, and you know, being extra kind of careful, giving extra time, being extra patient around the time of the total lunar eclipse, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, those days will help immensely. You'll either keep checking to make sure everything is as it should be uh, and setting off nice and early so that you don't run into traffic jams or there's some something else. You can take a precaution, but like, I said to uh, Virgo, your opposite sign, there are contracts here as well and legal matters here as well. And also there's this idea of spiritual justice. I suppose we could say that's karma, but we may be seeing an element of this or you may be seeing an element of this in your life, the effects of karma. Uh, mm, you know, what goes around comes around and that's very much tied to this total lunar eclipse. And you might like to observe that. And if um, you, you, know, you have some incredible good fortune at this time, you could say this is a result of good deeds done, whether in a long distant past or within memory. And if you know something does go a little bit pear-shaped, you have to look and see, could that have anything to do with this? <laughs> Always worthy of reflection at the very least. So if we come to Gemini, um, then uh, the, of course the sun at the moment is in your preceding sign. So the sun is in the 12th house and the lunar eclipse means the moon will be in your sixth house. And this is a very interesting part of the horoscope. Um, I always think that uh, you do a lot of preparation when the sun is in the 12th house. And so things need to be done quietly, privately, without fandango, you know? Um, and it's also a time of retreat. Uh, and ideally, you need to retreat. You need to cut down your social diary and perhaps uh, 
moderate the amount of energy you spend on things. Don't kill yourself, don't push yourself too hard. Because what happens on a full moon on this axis is that the weaknesses in the system are revealed. And that could be, you've pushed yourself too hard. And so you, you've got a health problem, you've got a dental problem. I always include dentistry when we're looking at the sixth 12 axis. So probably before this time, before we get the total lunar eclipse, Think about the things that are worrying you about yourself and get them checked out because that's a good thing to do before the eclipse. And then if at all possible, on the day of the eclipse, it is a Monday, which is kind of difficult not to do anything. But if you can be kind to yourself on the day of that eclipse, it will be worth it. And I think too, with the sun in the 12th house, the moon in the sixth house, we've got this idea of epiphanies here. Um, dreams having a great meaning so that you might wake up and say my goodness what was I doing in that place it was so real I could smell things I could taste things I could hear things well that dream has probably got a lot to say to you and the idea of this total lunar eclipse on the axis of uh, you know 12 6 then dreams are going to play a very important part in the process of what happens next Looking at it in reverse, we come to Sagittarius. The moon is in the 12th house. The sun is in the sixth house. So the sixth house has a lot to do with work, um, but it's not really work in the way we think of a career. It's, uh, I think always, doing the work of life. So it, isn't, it doesn't just reside in the workplace because it's doing the work of life with relationships, family, your home, yourself, the things that have to be done. This is what we have to do. We're doing the work of life. So here we have this total lunar eclipse involving, you know, the sun and the moon here. And we realize that things may have to change. We'll realize that things aren't working or that there's something drawing our attention to the fact that we really need to consider what we are doing and what our life constitutes and we probably need to make some changes in our lifestyle. And of course our work comes into that as well because to have a lifestyle, you've probably got to have work and an income as well. Um, but I often think it's the health system too, the system by which we run our lives and our health system. So as I was saying to Gemini, we really need to watch out for any health problems at this time and to get them knocked on the head before we get to the eclipse and not let the eclipse really wipe us out, okay? Also, I think looking at these last uh, four signs altogether, the mutable signs that I've been talking about, because this uh, lunar eclipse is focusing on the houses, which I call the seeking houses, they have something to do with seeking meaning, seeking purpose, seeking knowledge, and that's perhaps the importance of this eclipse in terms of what you are seeking. Final group, we'll start with Libra. Uh, well, uh, the moon is in your next door neighbor sign, the total lunar eclipse in the sign of Scorpio. So it means that uh, for you, this is in the second house, but of course the sun will be in the eighth house. So we have the axis of finances and self-esteem, self-worth playing long and loud. So in a way, look, what do we look at here? We're looking at the way you earn money and the way you share your money with other people because that's the eighth house. So there's a bit of a crisis here. <laughs> um, does it mean there's real imbalance? You're the one doing all the work and it's all your money that's being spent by the other person. Um, does it mean that you feel you're in a very unfair relationship with uh, a, a credit card company or a mortgage lender or uh, something else? Because balance has to be found here. And, and you know, Libra, you are the sign of balance. And if you are feeling aggrieved at this time, you feel unfairly, that the financial burden is on your shoulders or it's down to you to fix a financial problem, well, you know, it takes two. And whether it takes talking about a financial problem with a partner 
or whether it means talking about a financial issue with a credit card company or a bank or a business partner, then that's what you have to do. Things have to be ironed out. Now, of course, there's completion here as well. So again, we're looking at perhaps the signing of a deal. It's done. You've got it. And that could be good. Maybe you're closing and completing on a property deal, or maybe there's some other deal. That could be in there too. But there's a certain amount of stress and strain with this total lunar eclipse, as you know, because of Saturn's involvement. So things really have to be seen in their reality and faced. And there is another aspect here to this total lunar eclipse, the sun being in the eighth house, the moon being in the, in the second house. It's a lot to do with feelings and intimacy, whether we haven't got intimacy, and it's making us feel not very happy with life, uh, or whether there are real in issues over in intimacy and power in a relationship, then this lunar eclipse probably bring it all out and it needs to be dealt with. That's what I would say. Now, Aries, you've also got a share in this same narrative because it's the other way around. We've got the sun moving through your second house and the moon in your eighth. So again, this general period right through until the sun moves into the sign of Gemini, or in your case, if you've got uh, uh, Aries rising, sun moving through your second house, um, we've got this idea that it's about the money you make, the uh, provisions you provide, uh, your worth in terms of your assets, financial assets, material assets, as well as your worth in terms of what you do for a living, maybe, but also how people view you. And so that the journey of the sun through the second house is about really restoring it and giving it the sun's rays, if you like. So you're improving your self-worth. You're working to create more income and to solve your financial situation, to make it grow. So the full moon <clears throat> eclipse on that eighth axis means how much are other people contributing to your progress or conflicting with it? So there's still this nature of having to discuss finances, either with your significant other or your business partner or with credit cards, banks, you know, lending institutions. Let's talk about the balance in this financial relationship. Let's get it right. And the same thing about intimacy as well. You know, are you feeling that you're not <clears throat> getting that feedback you need in an intimate setting? There's a little bit of a crisis here and maybe a crisis about a relationship over sex. So that needs to be brought into your thinking as we approach this total lunar eclipse. Capricorn, the full moon itself in Scorpio in your 11th house, the sun in your fifth house, the axis of creativity. What a wonderful axis that is. In the fifth house, we give of ourselves, quite literally, where we produce an, an offspring, fifth house, where we give of ourselves in terms of art and creation, and we can be creative in many areas. We don't have to be an artist. We can be creative with words. We can be creative, well, as I often say, in the kitchen, um, with finances. And often it's a, a sort of sporty, physical area of the horoscope, the fifth house. So, you know, we've got the sun moving through there, but the moon and the total lunar eclipse on that 11th, fifth axis. So the emphasis, in a way, is not on my creativity and what I do to reproduce myself, if you like, but it's what do my gifts and how they affect humanity as a whole. And instead of something very single, this is what I do, this is what I give, it's all down to me, me, me. This is more about teamwork, about collaborations, about you know, what we do in terms of our place in the world, but in a humanitarian sense. So this 
lunar eclipse brings out our humanitarian spirit if we're, you know, a, a Capricorn. Um, but it also may bring about some kind of crisis about, you know, how much you give, how, how much other people are contributing to it. It can be an enterprise or an endeavor. Is, has it got legs? Has it not got legs? Who's pulling their weight in the team? Is it time to say enough's enough? We can't work together as a team. Or is it a celebration of having come this far and finally done it? You know, we've got it there. That's one of the things we also look at when we come to cancer. This idea, is this a culmination? The end of a gestation period, literally, maybe babies are in the offing, so that we have this idea that we've been preparing, gestating, and now we're ready for delivery. But of course, we can do this same process with a piece of work or a creative enterprise, even with a romance. Because let's face it, this is the creative area of the horoscope, the procreative area. And what do we need in order to procreate? We need another person. And that's how we procreate. So that's why this area has a lot to do with romance as well. So it may be, and in light of what I was saying about 4th of November last year, has a romance reached a critical stage? Are you going forward? Is it a, a long-term thing? Or has it sort of not got what you thought it has? So this might be the issue uh, for you, Cancer, or if you've got you know, this fifth, 11th axis here. So um, it, you know, that's its crunch point for a romance or a, a, a relationship that hasn't quite matured into marriage things like that. But I think also it's about offspring. And so we might be at a point where something is happening to one or more of your offspring, and that amounts either to a sense of great accomplishment. Remember the idea of a gestation period and a delivery applies now to your offspring as well. So is that in the mix? Saturn, of course, is in there as well. I have talked about Saturn both consolidating something and making it real, but also sometimes symbolizing, you know, that's it. That's it. There's no further we can go. So that's really my run through of all 12 signs of the zodiac. As you see, it is a, an axis. The opposition comes into play, which is why I've done it the way I do. And so we're at the point in my uh, video where I you know, talk about something, leave you with a thought, if you like. And my thought this week, you know, all of them are really inspired by my clients and my work, all the things that happened to me in my life. And just recently, it's funny, I've had a lot of astrocartography to do. Uh, that means looking at where in the world your Venus is, you know, where it cuts through different parts of the world. And I quite enjoy looking at, uh, you know, astrocartography. But what I want to talk about here is the idea of relocating so that if you relocate to another area, that somehow you can now look at your chart relocated. So let's say you move from London to New York, you now relocate your chart as if you were born in New York. Well, I don't buy that for one single second, two reasons. First of all, that moment in time, when you were born, where you were born, is your signature. That's always there. That imprint is who you are and how your life unfolds. Yes, of course, we may go to New York, and if we look at New York City or America, and we see those charts, and we look at how our natal chart fits into that country, that city, that could be full of meaning, full of illumination. But we've got our whole job, we don't just simply change our fortunes because we change the place where we're living. And I'm very keen on this idea. Well, I know some people will argue with me about this, but I personally don't subscribe to that. One of the questions that came up was the idea of, I really feel ready to change. I'm not happy where I am at all. 
And I want to move somewhere in the world where I think I'm going to be happy and successful. I know I'm not where it is. Now, that's a, a different thing entirely. And I think the staying, I'm not happy where I am, is actually making a bigger statement. I'm not happy where I am in myself, is what we're saying. Yes, you may get a job and it'll take you to uh, Oslo in Norway. And it, there you find, you love it, you have it, you know, success and whatever. But what's taken you there isn't looking at the chart of Norway or reload, looking at your chart with, with relocation and astrocartography. That has come out of your life through something that you have experienced or you've got behind. So happiness is not something we can seek. This is another aspect of all of this. Happiness resides within us always. We can't seek it. It's a byproduct of our lives. So back again to feeling that you need a change and you'd like to move to a very different place. I understand that. I felt it, I know it very, very well. But we normally have to fix what's wrong in our lives first. And we need to put that first. So you're not happy in your relationship. You're not happy in the life that you lead generally. You're unfulfilled at work. Well, those things need fixing before you buy a ticket and pack your case and set off for life in Timbuktu. Things need fixing. And I think that's really very important because you are fixing your happiness as well. Because the things that are really standing in the way of your happiness are things that you need to do something about in your own life. So we can't seek happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of our life. So thank you for watching and I look forward to uh, being here again in another couple of weeks. Bye for now.